show. And with this, I hand over to the moderator of this panel, um, Matthew, Matthew Matt uh, Kanishnik, and he is, you are, Chief Europe Correspondent um, Politico. And uh, thank you so much for making time joining us today and taking over the moderation. Um, this is the time for me to watch, enjoy, and to relax. <laughs> Well, thank you, Stormy, for the invitation. It's great to be with all of you here in what I suspect will be one of the, the last in-person events of, of this year, unfortunately. Um, obviously, those of you tuning in online aren't here in person, but nonetheless, you can feel a bit of the uh, in-person vibe, hopefully. Uh, we're going to be discussing what is really one of the most important issues of our time. Uh, and I love the title of this session. It could be a, a Politico headline, Friends or Foe, Digital Sovereignty and the EU-US-China Triangle. And uh, to join us to discuss this, we have really a, a top flight transatlantic panel here. I will start on the other side of the Atlantic to introduce Molly Montgomery, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, at the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs in Washington. We also have Renaud Fedel from France, who's a Ministerial Coordinator for Artificial Intelligence in France. And to my right here, uh, live in Berlin, we have Roderich Kiesewetter, a member of the German Bundestag, and more importantly, a colonel in the Bundeswehr, or former colonel, retired colonel. Once a colonel, always a colonel, as they say. Uh, so I, I would like to uh, start off to, to get the discussion going here with a, you know, kind of more, more general uh, question to, to all three of you. And, um, you know, I mean, as I said at the, at the outset, this is, this is an issue that, um, you know, I think is top of mind both in Washington and certainly in, in Europe at the moment. Um, and, and in June of, of this year, as many of you in the audience will remember, EU Commission President von der Leyen and President Biden officially launched what is known as the EU-US Trade and Technology Council which is a very uh, difficult uh, idea to get your head around if, you're, if you don't know the, the details. But the point of it was to affirm cooperation across the Atlantic on, on this field that we're discussing today. So maybe just to start briefly with you, Molly, from an American perspective, uh, wh what do you think are the, the most pressing digital issues at the moment where you could imagine a closer cooperation between between Europe and the U.S. and and where is that most needed? Absolutely. Well, and first of all, thanks, Matt, for moderating, and uh, thanks to Stormy and the entire Aspen team. It's great to be with you here today. Although I wish it could certainly be in person. Um, you know, we think the Trade and Technology Council is a really exciting development, and uh, the initial. Um, ministerial earlier this fall really demonstrated its potential and the broad array of issues um, on which we seek uh, deeper cooperation with the EU. Uh, but to answer your question directly, I think, you know, number one for us at the moment really is finding um, a resolution to uh, Privacy Shield and its successor agreement um, that is going to provide certainty to the thousands of businesses and research institutions that rely on transatlantic data flows and that really is going to be a durable solution that protects privacy, facilitates data flows, and ensures our, our collective security. Um, second, I would just say that we're really seeking closer alignment and cooperation on tech regulation. Uh, we recognize that we, we won't always agree in terms of the approach, but I think our objectives uh, are have a lot in common, uh, particularly in the Biden administration. And so we believe it's really important for us to work toward complementary, risk-based, innovation-friendly approaches uh, to regulating the tech market. Uh, and that we really need to ensure that we have interoperability and compatibility um, between uh, our regulatory legal systems um, on both sides of the Atlantic. And then finally, I would just say that we need to work together to preserve and defend our vision of the internet as open, interoperable, secure, and reliable for our citizens. 
And that also means ensuring the development and deployment of sensitive emerging technologies is done in a way that strengthens our democracies and institutions and defends against authoritarian approaches such as the PRCs. Um, so I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop there and look uh, forward to talking more about the TTC. Yes, exactly. We've got, we've got plenty of time, um, but I would, I would like to, to come to kind of an opening impression also from Renault because, uh, you know, listening to Molly, it sounds like, well, this should be pretty easy. We can all kind of, you know, get going on this tomorrow. But it is actually quite complicated because there are differing views on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. How, how do you see things from uh, Paris, uh, Renault, in terms of the transatlantic cooperation on the digital frontier? Well, we both have been challenged in uh, 2017 by by other by other competitors in the, in the field of AI and digital that claim to be the, at the form at the forefront of uh, digital innovation in 2030. And I think we need to take both necessary steps to remain uh, Europe and, the, and our ally in the United States and Canada at the frontier of the technological wave. That means to have and to train more talent to retain them to attract more capital, to invest more, uh, and also to strengthen our markets. Uh, we have, we in Europe, uh, we clearly are, at the moment are lagging, lagging behind. And we have, there are some imbalances are for us to resolve. For instance, our digital market, it may be not be unified enough. And at the same time, we also need to correct imbalances in our relation, uh, for instance, with, uh, with North America. Uh, today in Europe, uh, there are some very powerful companies who, had, who act as, as gatekeepers, and sometimes they don't always refrain from a kind of olig oligopolistic behavior. So there is this new legislation uh, drafted by the Commission, which is very important. And also, uh, I wish we would uh, spend much less time with, with uh, the, the hassle of dealing with unilateral legislations, uh, dealing with data, and, and, and these kind of um, Legislation uh, take a lot of time and energy that we could focus more on acting together in, in order to uh, to tackle the, 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 the challenges of the future. Uh, as the, um, the Trade Council, which was very interesting uh, setup, we have a common understanding, both at the OECD and GPI. There, will be, there has been a mapping of the principle, but now we, get to, we need to, to get more to the bottom of things. Uh, the AI Act is doing, it, is doing it in one way, the NIST and the US are doing it in another way, but I think even if on one side there is legislation and on the other side there is voluntary um, normalization, I think we, we need to work together because we know that AI, for instance, needs a lot of uh, re-engineering methods due to, the, to its statistical uh, nature. So that's a lot of work and I think we can overcome our difference of approaches and getting these things done. That's what I wanted to say uh, introductory. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Roderick, um, you know, when, when the TTC was announced uh, back in June, a lot of people looked at it and said, well, there isn't, you know, as much sort of meat on the bone there as, as you know, a lot of people <laughs> were, were calling for. H how do you see this situation? What do you think the focus should be, should mm -hmm. be here? Yeah, thank you very much indeed also for the invitation. I really feel delighted also because it is in the representation of my home country, Baden-Württemberg. So thanks a lot. Um, nevertheless, we need to look uh, more European and more uh, transatlantic. Um, therefore, I really would align myself. Germany cannot afford to be in a position of arbitrariness. And therefore, the latest IT law, the IT security law, which passed in April this year, was quite outspoken. Nevertheless, it was delayed for more than one year which gave room to those who supported some Chinese devices in this. So what we need is a clear position aligned with our European neighbors, and we need a stronger transatlantic cooperation. Why? We, need, we cannot only create new bodies like the alliance of like-minded nations or the alliance of liberal democracies. We also need to foster this as just uh, Mr. Videl mentioned, uh, to create a common market for these security devices. And we also need inside Germany, for example, a clear announcement of uh, some uh, business, of some enterprises which are in contact with uh, Chinese business and that they also bring up it to the, to the government. And therefore, it is also important that we need to notify the government if there are signed some new contracts 
uh, for critical 5G components. So in this context, I believe that with the new law, Germany is aligned much closer with Paris and with Washington than it was in the past. And therefore, I believe that the new government will uh, have to develop this even clearer. We need also for our economy clear clarity and also we need uh, that there is a chance that we Europeans exchange much more amongst each other on the European level and we need uh, with the view of more transatlantic cooperation some levels of engagement where we have the chance to exchange not only views but to create common standards. So this I think is a better position than we had two years ago. Uh, M M Molly, what, what do you think of that? Do you think that we're moving towards really common standards here? Because I think in Europe, a lot of people uh, look at what has come out of Washington on these issues over the past couple of years, and they think, well, the U.S. just wants Europe to, to do what the U.S. wants Europe to do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if, it, if that's not using uh, Huawei 5G, then, you know, uh, the, the expectation is that uh, every, everybody, Droppen and Roderick was talking about the, the, the situation in, in Germany at the moment, uh, but you know, there, there's also language in, in, in the, in the, in the German true. law which uh, you know, would allow for, for some use of, of, of Huawei components. So it's a long-winded way of asking you, what, what does the U.S. really want of, of, of Europe right now on this front? Absolutely. Well, I would say zooming back out to the triangle uh, that's really in the title of this panel, I think what we're really focused on is ensuring that the shape of that triangle um, reflects our common values and uh, the fact that we are much, much closer to each other, even when we have differences, than we are to authoritarian regimes. And I would say specifically the PRC, but also Russia and others. And so that's why we've really focused on the TTC, but also conversations bilaterally to try to have really a constructive approach to talking about um, regulation that uh, is originating in the EU, whether that is the DSA and the DMA or the AI Act uh, or the EU's Cloud Act to try to find complementary approaches because we recognize that whether it's on 5G standard setting, um, AI, investment screening, supply chains, um, we really do have common interests and we need to be working together um, because we are you know, facing the same sorts of challenges. Um, and so uh, overall, I would say that is very much the approach of the Biden administration. I, I won't speak for the previous administration. I think certainly the tone has changed. But on issues like 5G, I will say that a commonality, even though that tone has changed and, and we've really turned a page uh, in transatlantic relations and certainly bilateral relations with Germany, we do continue to really sound the alarm in terms of the risks that are posed by untrusted vendors in critical communications um, technologies and that that just can't be mitigated. So, but we continue to have those conversations bilaterally um, in a constructive and respectful way uh, and really look forward to working particularly with the new German government um, as it develops its approaches to all of these issues. Uh, Renaud, uh, coming back to your, to your specialty, which is uh, artificial intelligence, obviously, um, you, your country uh, adopted this artificial intelligence strategy back in, in, in 2018, which I think by European standards makes you pioneers uh, in this in this regard, um, and just to review for people who aren't familiar with the strategy, it, it has three main objectives, which are to strengthen the uh, attraction of, of talent and investment to, to pull people in from from outside France as well in this area, to disseminate AI and data in the economy, and uh, to promote an ethical model of uh, AI, which as we know, might be the, the, the biggest challenge of all here. But looking back over the sort of nearly three years that you've been uh, doing this now in France, how would you say this, this strategy has developed so far? 
Well, I, I wouldn't claim France is especially original or pioneer. Germany has done its own strategy, Sweden, the Netherlands. Uh, and then there is the there has been the coordinated EU plan uh, revised uh, in April this year. What I think is uh, the future of industry will be based uh, a big part on, on AI, which has so far all the characteristics of a general purpose technology. Not only, it's not the only technology, it will be other technology, maybe quantum um, and, and others, but it will be very important. Uh, and so we, that's why we have invested a lot in order to, uh, to make emerge the new uh, industrial base of the future. And 2021 uh, is really the marking of a takeoff of the European uh, landscape. We, we see it in, in these investments. Uh, Germany has tripled, France has doubled, uh, in all of the countries, and in, in total now there are, so that something is, is happening. And at the same time, we need, we need to help this, uh, this space to thrive. For instance, in, in, in the US, uh, you have a very interesting, uh, and lots of startups are, are going to us because a lot of the innovative actors are from the medium or startups world. And, not, and they say, oh, in the US, they have the Small Business Act. And in Europe, we, can have, we, can, we don't have such a, such a tool. And, and it's not just because then uh, we cannot contest the markets. We cannot grow enough. So that's something we, sh we, should, um, we should strive. We need an industrial policy, not against uh, our partners and very close allies. But we also need to be able to strengthen our industrial base and to make it, uh, to make it thrive uh, in the 21st century. Uh, at the moment, we can see that a lot of European talents are going to the US. That's a good thing because uh, obviously uh, American companies are very innovative and something is happening and research in AI is happening in the private sector. But at the same time, we don't see often enough uh, the reversal trends. So this is also something we need to correct. Some of the explanations are us, because uh, sometimes uh, we are not uh, as, as innovative or some of our regulations are too strict. And sometimes it's also imbalance that can be uh, talked with our, our American friends and, and, and redressed. So yeah, I think really this is something that we, sh we sh try to address in our strategy. And also it's not a zero sum game. So that's why in the new phase of the strategy, we will invest much more in talent. Uh, at the moment, there is a general shortage and not only in, uh, in data scientists, also in developers and software. Uh, we, and we need to train more people. Uh, and we need to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, integrate more our startup communities across Europe. Uh, each time I, I talk to a startup, they say, I want to go to the US and not enough. I want to go to Germany or to Sweden or to the Netherlands or to Spain. And this is a mindset we need to change also. But I mean, just a, a quick follow up on that. I mean, given that the US has been this magnet for a lot of European talent and investment in this area. And, you know, we see that, I think, in Berlin as well. Whenever there's a successful startup here, mm -hmm. they tend to turn to US venture capital money as soon as they get a little bit of momentum, um, because that's really where you know the uh, the, the market is. Um, wh why not promote more transatlantic cooperation here rather than a kind of you know Europe go it alone strategy? Especially since in Europe uh, you're also competing with the Russians and and the Chinese in this space. Well, actually, we 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 are, we are an open. Economy uh, and I, I, and we have seen it in, in the last two years. Some things are changing. Uh, VC investors are coming now to Europe. They have doubled their share, and now they don't. A, a, a few three or four years ago, each time a VC venture a VC uh, came to France to see a company, they said, "Oh, we are going to finance you, but you need to relocate your your headquarters in the U.S." Now we see more and more uh, that they have understood that they have some some value to bring. And that they can we can keep the headquarters in France or in Germany, and, and that we can uh, we can do a, a much more balanced cooperation. That's also something to do. we don't want all our assets to systematically being relocated. That that's something we need. If you want to compete with China uh, or with Russia, we need both to be strong, the U.S. and Europe. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to compete with these guys. Uh, Roderick, coming coming back to you, this is clearly a challenge that Germany uh, has has as well, um, and I, th I think uh, a lot of people in the United States, at least, um, 
maybe not Mali, but other, other people I know would, would look at Germany and say, well, they want, they want to have it both ways. You know, China's become Germany's largest trading partner, um, and, you know, which is obviously uh, important to the German economy, but there are also uh, some concerns about uh, what the Chinese are doing uh, elsewhere uh, in, in the region and around the world, and even, even in, in Europe, and uh, what some see as their sort of malevolent behavior. Uh, Germany has so far kind of avoided provoking the Chinese on a lot of a lot of these issues. How, how sustainable is that? Do you think in this uh, digital sphere, if if you and Germany want to both cooperate with the United States going forward, especially in the security sphere, which is existential to to Germany's security and to Europe's security, uh, and also continue to kind of curry favor with the Chinese. Yeah, well, first of all, I, be, I think that it is really important also to show the public that the biggest share, the greatest share of our trade has the European Union. So in common, the European Union is a stronger partner than China. So, and, and after China, immediately uh, the United States uh, is, this, is the third in sequence. Although so, the U.S. is still the largest export market. Yeah, really. that's true, and, and we should be aware of that. And we have only shares in China focused on automotive and some other specific uh, um, mechanized industry, some, some other uh, specific areas of business. But it is not an overall um, challenge in China because we have much more investments inside the European Union and in the United States. So just to delineate that a little bit. A second remark. Um, I'm a member of the French-German Parliamentary Assembly, and one of our projects is a common, combined French-German artificial intelligence project, which will be located either in Baden-Württemberg, in Saarland, or in Haute-Lorraine. So we are on that. So th there will be an, a challenge, there will be also a chance for young scientists all over Europe to bring in their knowledge and it is up to us to create an innovative atmosphere inside the European Union that our startups are trustworthy and that they see they are also ex uh, accepted in, in the way of their, of their business and uh, their conduct of their business. Because otherwise, uh, we see it in Germany, we, we invest a lot in, in the knowledge <laughs> of the universities or a lot, uh, a lot in the knowledge. I think the, the micro doesn't, no, it works again. Um, so we invest a lot in the, in the knowledge and in the, in the innovative uh, power of our young people, but then they see a better environment in the United States because the research and development atmosphere, the climate is much more uh, inspiring there. So, uh, we should not take it as a given that young people stay here, invest here, and also try to create uh, their business here. We have too high barriers, uh, too many thresholds, um, which we need to overcome for a more common and comprehensive uh, approach for those who invest in, start in startups. So we have on the one side the investors, and we have on the other side the young people. We need the brains uh, for the future. As regards competition, we see that the, the challenges we, we see every day in the Bundestag, for example, um, like uh, the ATP attacks from Russia, like attacks from China as well, from universities, we need a kind of competition as well in the universities, not to hack foreign countries, but uh, to, to create an atmosphere where our own young people are willing uh, to, to better compete with, with uh, like-minded in other European states and in the United States. Um, but what Russia is doing and also what China is, is, uh, is trying to achieve is an, a climate of competition in the universities uh, where they try, financed by the state actors, uh, to hack in our systems. And in, in the German debate, we focus too much on data protection, on individual data protection, but not in the data protection of our small and medium enterprises. So there is also a gap, uh, not only in perception, but also in, in the willingness and the political will to bring, to close these gaps. 
uh, our federal office in, in this context, the uh, BS, BSI, is willing to do that, but a lot of enterprises avoid to, to come into contact uh, with this federal office because it's also a question of honor and a question of silence uh, to be mute about uh, attacks in this context. Therefore, I, I plea for more courage, for a more encouraging approach amongst uh, the European states, and I hope that we, after the election in France, might also have a better uh, cooperation with Poland so that the Weimarian Triangle uh, can become a catalyst in this context also for the Eastern European countries. So we need a broader approach uh, instead of only looking into domestic issues. I, I believe that in Germany, after the hacking of, of the Bundestag and after severe losses in some um, significant enterprises, we have a change in the attitude now. So you're referring to the, the uh, Weimar Triangle, that's the cooperation between Germany, Poland, Poland and France, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, a diplomatic format mm -hmm. there. Um, but, but Molly, when, when you look at Europe on these issues, uh, if you think about, you know, if you really want to address a burning issue, you mentioned the privacy shield, the data issues, and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, what, what is your first port of call? Because you, you talked about the importance of bilateral relations, uh, but ultimately a lot of these issues will be decided uh, in, in, in Brussels. Um, has, has that gotten easier, uh, do you think, to, to deal with, 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 we don't have anybody from the commission here, but has it, has it gotten easier uh, to, to address these, these matters in, in Brussels, or do you prefer the bilateral approach? Absolutely. So I would say we fully understand that, that we need to be engaging both in Brussels and in, in key member state uh, capitals. And, you know, we view uh, the Trade and Technology Council as a key forum to have these conversations. And I think one of the benefits of the TTC is that it's really catalyzed a lot of engagement between um, not just the State Department, uh, but also our trade representative, uh, Ambassador Tai, as well as our Commerce Secretary and other actors within the U.S. government with their counterparts um, in the Commission. And there's really a regular exchange there on all of these issues. So it's not just the ministerial meeting of the TTC, uh, you know, that is our, a one-shot deal. Um, we really are working day in and day out on these issues with, with the Commission. Um, but I also would say we fully understand that, you know, member states play a really key role. And we have heard from a lot of member states that they want to make sure that they are engaged with us on these issues. And so uh, whether it's Paris or Berlin, um, whether it's Warsaw um, or beyond, um, you know, we are really having robust conversations on the full spectrum of issues. I mean, Privacy Shield, as I mentioned, is for us extremely urgent. Um, that is something that's being dealt with uh, in a separate channel from the TTC because we were already engaged in negotiations before that was established, uh, but certainly something where we are engaging the commission regularly um, and negotiations are ongoing, uh, but also having conversations with member states uh, to ensure that they understand just how important uh, we believe this is uh, to everything that we are trying to do together in the digital space to ensure that we have reliable data flows and that we're able to to move forward on that front. Okay, I, I, I do want to open the, the floor to questions uh, in, in a moment, so prepare your questions if, if you have any. I did have another question for uh, Renaud, though, before we get to that, which is re responding to uh, what, what Molly was just saying. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, Europeans often forget the fact that for people looking at Europe from the outside, it, it does look like this kind of cacophony of, of, of voices. Uh, j just yesterday, we, we heard uh, Josep Borrell not speaking specifically about uh, digital issues, but speaking broadly about Europe's positioning towards the United States and towards China. He talked about a hedging strategy, uh, which, which sounds more like a financial tactic and investing uh, uh, strategy uh, than, than diplomacy. Um, but Renaud, to you, um, you know, there obviously are, you know, is tension here on, on a lot of these issues. Do, do you think that Europe really has its act together and can speak with one voice on these central questions? 
uh, be it the, the privacy shield or 5G or w whatever the, the question might be? Well, we always uh, have uh, more difficulties because we, are, we have a, a, a set of nations. I, am, I really feel truly European. I was raised with a house house partner in Germany and I love it when I go to, to Finland or, or southern uh, Greece and spend uh, my money with the same currency. And at the same time, uh, it's more difficult to act. I, I, and that's why Europe is now needs to, uh, to develop a more sovereignty approach uh, with in, in an industrial policy, uh, a common defense policy in a world where, even including the US, they have said that uh, their interests are sometimes a, a bit more uh, pointed at Asia than in Europe. So we need to, to, to take uh, on ourselves. And even in the digital world, when I look at uh, what Europe has to boast, sometimes we, I think, even in France is not uh, above uh, all other members, we sometimes uh, not enough feel European and act Europeanly. Uh, in the tech world, if you take uh, IMEC, if you take uh, ASML, if you take the providers in, in the Nordic countries, if you take uh, Germany's uh, excellent um, robotics that now is turning to, uh, to AI, uh, we have a lot of strengths and we need to uh, have a more European mindset. And, and I think uh, when the digital, digital economy is, is turning, when the economy is, uh, as a whole is turning to digital, we also have to signal to our friends that it is normal for us to claim that taxation is located where activity is. It is normal also to claim that our small, our Mittelstand, our small businesses uh, can be protecting like the American ones have a small business act. Uh, and there is a, really an issue about the cloud. Everybody is turning to the cloud. All activities are turning to the cloud. But there is a problem if the cloud business and uh, information and secret trades are not protected from unilateral uh, legislations. And then the, the only uh, authority that, can, that has the power to claim to resolve this is the Court of European Justice. And it won't, it, it won't dodge the, the, the fact. So there will not be an agreement unless we resolve this. And it, it's not only a question of Europe. It's a, it's a, it should be a joint endeavor. Okay. Um, I had... Because these, these are co-assets. These are our co-assets are turning to the cloud. So we, they, we have, we have to be sure that they are protected. Right, right. I mean, I guess the missing piece here though, Roderick, is, is China. Uh, because, you know, this is often portrayed as a uh, sort of discussion, you know, as I have today, between, primarily between the United States and Europe, which I think it is, because on a lot of these issues, China is more sort of this specter somewhere in the background there. Nobody really knows what they're up to. We're all worried about <laughs> what they're going to do. And yet there is a lot of tension in this bilateral relationship, mainly because uh, this space is so dominated by American companies, as, as Renaud was just uh, alluding to. Um, wh what do you think the outlook is on, on, on that front? I see a real security challenge in this context. Um, just an example, the American government asked a big American, very well-known enterprise to improve by artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence their drone systems due to the collateral damages uh, the Americans experienced in the last years. Well, I think, and, we, I think and, we mostly imposed the collateral damage and yeah, others but, experienced it. But this yeah. enterprise denied to take over this task from the American government due to the fact that the greening of international investments is also including investment in defense. So I don't, uh, it, it's a very, very well known enterprise, one of the biggest in the world. But no Chinese enterprise would deny such a mission from the Chinese government. So in the long run, I see a gap. If we, in our greening of investments, in our assessment of sustainable investments, avoid to create an atmosphere that the security industry is willing, or those who have tools in the artificial, artificial intelligence which might help the security industry, if they deny because of the um, investor's uh, relationship. On the other side, the Chinese see and, and have a great overlook about our situation. And they will go into the gaps we have. Second remark, one of the lessons learned 
uh, during COVID is, is that we need to improve our resilience. And in parallel, the United States have created the US CHIP Act, and recently the European Union announced uh, the idea of a European uh, CHIPS Act, uh, which aims to have a share of about 20% of the global chip production by 2030. So we have lessons learned, and we also try to, to bring it into practice. But I believe that China will be faster, and they will use our, or will abuse, our weaknesses in certain parts. But we should not see this as a weakness. We should convince those enterprises who are able to support governmental decisions by artificial tools, artificial intelligence tools. Uh, otherwise, in the, in the strategic competition, we will open the gap for others. And we should also, when we look to the European Union and the Green Deal, I must mention that, that, that the European uh, endeavor must be more comprehensive and inclusive. The European Green Deal opens the door for China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and to a certain extent also Turkey, with regard to the decarbonization of Kosovo, of um, Bosnia, of Algeria, and Libya, who are not able to decarbonize. But the Green Deal allows only to, uh, to cooperate with these countries if, if they show the willingness. So I would like to put this on the level of artificial intelligence and of uh, digitalization. If we lose these countries, we lose also brains to China or Russia. Therefore, we should survey and check our political ideas also in other fields that they have a contribution to a more comprehensive security understanding. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to open it up for questions now. Um, maybe in the room here, there's a question in the um, third row. We'll come to the first row. Should we, should we collect questions? Yeah? OK. Um, why don't we start here, then, in the uh, first row, and then we'll get to Thank you. Thank you so much. And great to be here with Stormy and with all of you. I'm Gabriela Ramos. I'm the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. And I want to bring the conversation to the business model of artificial intelligence, because what I hear from all of you is how much the, this triangular cooperation is trying to um, preserve and advance the competitive edge of these regions and, and try to advance a model for digital transformation that is uh, according to our values. But we just approved a, a recommendations on the ethics of artificial intelligence last week, 193 countries, and I haven't heard anything in this conversation about what do we do with the dangers of the downsides of artificial intelligence and the business model in terms of privacy, in terms of how data is gathered, how data is used. And therefore, I would like to hear more about these uh, human rights ethical <laughs> issues of artificial intelligence, if you're dealing with it at all or not. OK, yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe one more question, and then we'll tackle those. I'm, I, hi, Joanna Bryson, uh, Heritage School. Um, I, I'm really glad I'm going second. This is sort of a related question, um, but also from the business perspective. So in uh, June of this year with Helena Malikova, the Director General of Competition of the EU, uh, I published a paper that looked at these questions, the, the sort of myth about, or, or potential myth about the, um, the AI Cold War. And, and was it true that there, there were graphs that were going around showing that just in terms of large market capitalization companies, uh, only the U.S. and China had any, had any skin in the game, basically. Nobody else could touch them. They were dominating the world. And so we looked instead at the number. We knew that actually uh, the U.S. in fact innovated antitrust because it's dangerous to have too large of companies. And so this is where the tie-in is. But I'm now talking on the economic perspective. Innovation comes out of a strong SME sector. It's been shown over and over. And uh, so we, we looked at what was happening in terms of patents registered at WIPO and also at um, market capitalization of companies that had listed at least two WIPO patents in AI in one of the subcategories of AI in 2019. And what we showed was that the US was dominating the whole rest of the world combined on those two measures. 
Um, however, China and the EU were not so different from each other. And interestingly, the rest of the world, which is not being mentioned in this triangle, we drew a quadrangle of some form, uh, the rest of the world actually had more than China and the EU combined in both WIPO patents, listed patents, and market capitalization. Now again, I think that's partly because Saudi Arabia and Japan had been encouraged, and actually Switzerland, had been encouraged in this large market capitalization strategy, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing. But my, my, I didn't only want to give you data, I actually wanted to come back to a question about that, which is that you know, we talk about a lot of talent going to, to America, and a lot of it does, although living in Berlin, believe me, a lot is coming here right now too, including from American companies. But uh, the, uh, is, is, isn't that part of what's destabilizing potentially America? We, all, we were just hearing about the previous presidency. We don't, know what's, we, we don't know if the lack of antitrust actions in the United States right now is a good thing. So even if it's true that Europeans and again, colleagues from all over the world are going in and building the AI that's affecting the whole world, is it necessarily the right thing? Maybe they're getting too much fun. <laughs> and, and maybe this, there's an awful lot of people in America who are poor and don't have health care and things like that that are suffering from the lack of regulation there. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to have to run through these questions. Maybe, uh, Renaud, would you uh, take the first one on the ethical uh, impact of AI and, um, you know, whether we should be paying more attention to that uh, already. I think it is for a lot of people kind of a, uh, a, a vague fear that they have. But certainly in the hands, as we know, of, of certain governments around the world, uh, it can be very frightening. And, and companies. I, 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 I would congratulate uh, Gabriela on the, on, the, on the success of uh, UNESCO having uh, drafted this, uh, this uh, ethical framework in such a large uh, set of countries. And I, and I would like to say that uh, we are not dodging the question because uh, Europe will issue, has proposed its first regulation, which uh, is heavily skewed towards taking into account these, uh, these issues. Uh, and it will impose a lot of uh, constraints uh, onto European companies or, imp or import in companies or, so, or companies uh, in, uh, operating in Europe. Uh, and in the past, uh, the GDPR has not prevented uh, uh, companies from both investing to Europe, so, so we are dealing with these issues, uh, and also uh, the Global Partnership on AI, which is still a young organization, has 10 projects uh, with, with the US, with Canada, with Mexico, with Japan, Korea, and we are already uh, trying to invent uh, or to share ideas or projects on these issues, so I think uh, some line of work is really being done there. Um, and at the same time, I also think uh, this is something we should uh, tackle jointly, Europe and, and, uh, and the America. Uh, we need to also help other countries which are less technologically advanced not to be, uh, to be seduced or having uh, the only resolution to go to China to, to, to have their technology. We have to help them acquire this technology. We have to do uh, AI for good also. For instance, we know that some states have very weak infrastructures and they sometimes uh, of observation can, can help. And so it's also a responsibility of our own companies to help provide services, sometimes for free or for cheap, to, to farmers, to local industries. Uh, and this is probably something uh, where we will need to develop new cooperation policies, economic development policies, uh, and where they will need to be more digital and more AI uh, based. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... I think you, you've really put your finger on what, what is you know, probably the, 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 the most important issue here, how this technology is going to be used. But I wanted to come to the other question as well. Molly, do you want to take uh, the, the second question on um, you know, whether there should be more antitrust regulation and actions uh, in, in the U.S. Around, uh, you know, I think not not just AI. You were speaking more 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 broadly uh, on, you know, the, uh, the the digital sphere that um, that the United States has created this kind of uh, group of robber barons, modern day digital robber barons, who are going to, uh, you know, lord over the the rest of of the world. 
Sure. I would just say that, you know, I think this administration in, in some respects is still developing its approach uh, to those issues, but certainly in the executive order that the president issued uh, on competition policy, it did include some specific concerns about excessive concentration in the tech sector. Um, and obviously there are a lot of proposals on Capitol Hill in terms of uh, how we might address those issues. And so the administration is really working with Congress uh, to find appropriate ways to achieve objectives such as protecting privacy, promoting competition, addressing disinformation, you know, and, and addressing uh, the concerns that Joanna has, has raised. Um, on the AI question, I just want to point out um, that one of the working groups that we have in the Trade and Technology Council is specifically on the misuse of technology and the impact on human rights um, and other uh, and security concerns, et cetera. Um, and so the AI issues that were raised um, in the previous question are very much part of those discussions. I know we've talked specifically about surveillance, about social scoring, um, you know, other uh, concerns in terms of the ethical use of AI. And so I, I just want to note that that is, that is really at the heart of a lot of the conversation in the TTC. Um, and, and I think it goes to the point that was raised earlier as well in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring that these technologies are used uh, to in line with our values and that we also are promoting resilience and protecting and strengthening our institutions. And that's both within you know, the United States and the EU. And I'm the first to admit that we have work to do um, on our own democratic institutions um, to strengthen them and to improve resilience. But also as was mentioned in places like the Western Balkans and other areas that are particularly vulnerable to influence from authoritarian regimes such as the PRC and Russia. And I think that's an area that is, is very ripe for US EU cooperation as well. Thank you. Um, we have run out of time. I just wanted to give you, Roderick, the last word on this issue because you're a military man. Um, you know, we hear now that the Chinese have the ability to identify people from up to 100 meters wearing a mask uh, in, a, in a matter of, of milliseconds. Are, are, are we naive in, in the West on these issues and thinking that we're going to, you know, be able to convince people to play by the rules as this technology develops? Or is it just inevitable that uh, you're going to have actors like China, other authoritarian uh, regimes using this technology as they uh, clearly already are? Uh, if you look at what's going on in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs and so forth, uh, mm. to uh, to repress uh, people. As a politician, I'm also used to look to the positive sides. Nevertheless, there are some challenges we have to cope with. We will not avoid China becoming a leading or one of the lead nations in artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, in November 19, I had the chance to accompany our foreign minister to China, and we had a chance to, to visit a, a uh, new upcoming business in, in mobility. A young lady with 30 years was the founder, and she had 300 million customers and 30 million drivers. And our foreign minister asked, what's with data? What's about data protection? And she said, why data protection? We want to improve the offer to our customers, and therefore we need open data access for all of us. And then she said, well, we have also about 86 million handicapped people, and 84 of them, we have data. We, we, they are interlinked with, with us. And then we can offer best practice for these people. And we can improve this also by artificial intelligence tools. So there are two worlds of understanding. I believe, at the end, we need to have an ethical framework, and we need to convince our people. The, it, the Chinese government does not need to convince their people, they control their people to a certain extent. And this might come at the end, in a decade or in two decades, also to a kind of turmoil. Because you cannot afford to have Uyghurs, Tibetans, Taiwanese, Hong Kong, and other challenges. So this social control at the end might not lead to success in the end. So we have to be very patient. 
but we need to be convinced about our own ethical standards and we need to communicate them. And the idea, and also Aspen could do this, and, and also other think tanks, we need to better advertise our system to our population. And we have to make our system more transparent in this context, and then we will be more competitive. And the place where competition will take place will be in the next two decades, will be Africa. Because China these days sees Africa as a doubling of their own market, because population will double in the next 25 years. And we see Africa as a continent of concern. But we should see Africa as a continent where we can prove our standards. And therefore, we should be a little bit more consistent, a little bit more coherent, but much more convinced in, in, in the way we promulgate our policies and in the way we create data protection in this environment. And then, probably, the young scientists who have a choice will not be seduced by Chinese international enterprises. They will be convinced and not be seduced by, by our ethical codes if we are attractive enough. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for that optimistic uh, view. Uh, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you, Roderick. Thank you, Molly, for joining us. Thank you, Renault in Paris. And thank you to everybody who tuned in online and who came here today.